Nigeria was named Africa's second leading ship-owning country in the 2015 Review of Maritime Transport by the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, UNCTAD. This is a rather impressive achievement. Shipping is presently regarded as the lifeblood of the world's economy, with merchant ships set to carry 90% of international trade on about 102,200 commercial ships worldwide. Bulk carriers, tankers, container vessels, cruise vessels, fishing trawlers and many other kinds of ships move across country borders, thereby aiding international trade and generating revenue. The strength of individual countries in the Committee of Maritime Nations is first measured by the number of ships each country owns and then by the cargo throughput, that is, the volume of cargo the country generates. Without ships, there is no maritime industry anywhere. And without having a ship owners of any country to carry the cargo that belongs to that country, there is no growth in that nation's maritime industry. Today, many maritime nations focus on exploiting their geographical advantage in addition to growing their indigenous fleet. With a coastline of over 750 kilometers, several ports, oil terminals, jetties and a population of over 180 million people, Nigeria is a nation with great maritime potential. Nigeria is also referred to as a cargo owner as well as a cargo destination. We are hoping that indigenous ship owning would really take off. And again, we generate a lot of cargo, millions of tons every year. We are export dependent, we are import dependent. Records indicate that in West and Central Africa, Nigeria generates more than 70% of the cargo throughput. Crude is her major export. What are the spiral effects of Nigerian ship owners operating successfully within the industry and within the country? What impact does that have on our employment, on our job generation? That's what we need to look at. What is the impact of owning one ship on the whole Nigerian economy? I don't think anybody has sat down to look at the issue of shipping as a cluster, as the impact it has on everything. I have a story, a, 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 a write-up by the Greek shipping industry where they talked of the impact of shipping, the maritime sector, as a cluster to the Greek economy. Various products and brands from all over the world are usually shipped in and have their wares displayed in Nigerian stores. According to the National Bureau of Statistics, NBS, Nigeria's crude oil exports in 2015 accounted for 71.4% of her total exports. 32.4% of imports into Nigeria in 2015 consisted of machinery and transport equipment. Mineral fuel accounted for 18.5%, while food and live animals made up 15% of the total import volume. This is in spite of the fact that imports into Nigeria in 2015 fell by 9.2%. But there is no gainsaying the fact that Nigeria has potential to earn huge revenue from her shipping industry. For some of us, we think that the maritime sector of this country is still very much at the uh, embryo stage. Um, for the opportunities that are bound, we are not even taking advantage. If, we, if the government should drive the right policies, the people that will profit is the government because there will be creation of employment, there will be a positive uh, socio-economic impact on our economy, there will be a reversal of the capital flight that we're experiencing right now, there will be transfer of skill positively to the system. So all this will accrue to the government taking credit for it. But if the sector remains untapped, not much would be achieved. As far as the Nigerian sphere is concerned, we, we can do better. Um, one of the things we have discovered is that we haven't really been able to dominate shipping within the domestic uh, um, uh, waters, let alone regional or deep uh, deep sea. 
Um, the government had tried a couple of times to see how it could use legislation to get this done. For instance, um, uh, we had a law in, um, in 1987, the National Shipping Policy Act, uh, but it was discovered that that actually was made to encourage deep sea uh, shipping and actually did not uh, give incentives for developing the, the local uh, shipping, local sector. And people say charity begins at home. The player is, a, is an instrument that government can use to achieve policies that will affect the overall social economy. A couple of years back, we had about 38 companies involved in deep sea fishing. Right now, we are less than nine. And Nigeria had over 200 trawlers. That was our fleet. Right now, we are not up to 100. We don't have up to 100. And we used to rank number two in the non-oil uh, exports uh, foreign exchange earners for the country. I don't even bother to ask for the statistics. So it is a business that has been left to die. And the question is why? Industry operators maintain that only 10% of the over 600 vessels operating offshore are owned by Nigerians. The cargoes of millions, go and check from MPA how much import they had last year. Not one, one ton of that import came with the Nigerian industry. Ask NMPC how much of crude do they export last year. Not one liter of that crew. If those things happen, then we are on the right path. Shipping is so strategic. Part of the projects we have in Kabuta is a situation whereby if there is any national emergency or a problem that causes foreign vessels not to come to Nigeria, you can rely on ships owned by Nigerians to have things carried, goods or persons. The African Union Commission, through Agenda 2063, has launched a campaign which demands member states to urgently key into the Blue Sea economy and develop capacity to own vessels. Many reasons have been given as to why there is a low level of participation by indigenous companies in shipping. The lack of access to funds and guarantee from government for outright purchase or the building of vessels top the list. We have huge need for vessels. And thankfully because of the Nigerian Nordic Pact, which really and truly doesn't specifically say that vessels must work there, but it can rest on the Cabotage Act that says a vessel built, owned, or you know, should work first. Seemingly some sort of right, uh, from a right of first refusal. So that's an industry that we can start with. And I think vessels are not things, or ships generally, are not things that you just jump into. I think it's something that you have to scale up over time. The absence of policies that support the investment of nationals in the sector, the abuse of the waiver clause in the Cabotage Act, poor corporate governance, the dearth of skilled workers, and an insufficient understanding of the business context of shipping. I think why this is, this is the case is that the institutional policy, regulatory and legal framework has not been correct. Government does not show whether it wants to allow private sector to intervene or whether it as government will be the key operators. And so the last big example of Nigeria as a powerful maritime nation was a long time ago, maybe 1976, when we had uh, about 46 vessels under the NNSL. The, the ball disappeared. But why? No one can decide whether the government or the private sector should drive shipping. That's what I don't know. That's the problem. I think the government uh, has a lot to do in the area of promoting ship owners in Nigeria. In terms of contracts, 
the contractual cycle sometimes takes forever. All right, so and most of those assets were purchased based on long-term contracts. And now, when you have short-term contracts, you can't pay for the vessel. So I think NMTC, uh, which is represented by NAPI, should help us in the area of having long-term contracts that we can use to pay for these assets that we require. It is popularly believed that Nigeria loses enormous freight revenue to foreign ship owners in the country. Depending on their use, size and configuration, ships cost millions of dollars. The experience in Nigeria is such that many ship owners resort to buying a second-hand vessel or scrap vessels due to the lack of funds. Nigerian owners are forced, due to lack of financing, to buy um, older vessels. And um, of course, naturally, these older vessels, the operating costs are a lot higher than the more modern vessels, um, which have a lower cost of um, operation than the older ones which are being acquired right now. So what happens is that the operating costs are quite high. Whereas you have um, the international players, the more foreign owners, who are bringing in more newer and more modern vessels, um, whose cost of operations are a lot lower, and therefore they are able to charge lower freight rates. They don't need to acquire scraps or second-hand vessels. You know, uh, it will be sufficient for people who build ships to get government guarantees. So government can actually support you without putting a penny on the table. So government itself has to do the due diligence on the person who wishes to buy a vessel. Until when CBN, federal government and the uh, Ministry of Transportation, understands that they have to come in and bail out ship owners in this country, we may not be able to get to where we're supposed to be. As they've done for the aviation and the agriculture, which have put agriculture in the forefront, they also have need to do it for the shipping. The Nigerian government in times past made unsuccessful attempts at funding the development of a national fleet as well as the building and acquisition of ships by indigenous companies. Some of these failed attempts include the defunct Nigerian National Shipping Line, NNSL, the failed Ship Acquisition and Shipbuilding Fund, SASBF, and the defunct National Unity Line, NUL. The NNSL is today credited with producing one of the finest crop of shipping experts and seafarers in Nigeria. Training programs at that time were structured to meet the need of the industry. The government also made funds available to private investors for the purchase of vessels through the Ship Acquisition and Shipbuilding Fund SASBF, project, which failed during its first test run. To be fair to the government, they have absolutely invested a lot of resources in trying to uh, develop indigenous capacity, starting from when the MNSL was established years ago. And over the years, of course, um, as the fleets, the initial fleet that they started with aged, the government invested money. But you see, I think that the government was served by ill advice in terms of the type of ships it bought and when it bought them. Let's look at the um, returnaging exercise that the government embarked upon in, I think it was around 1979, where the government embarked on a major fleet returnaging exercise. And they bought what was then thought to be a modern fleet. We bought ships that really had that V shape when the trend at that time was for vessels that were wider and squat. The second problem that they had again was a, um, um, issues such as the size of engine on the ship will determine the amount of consumption of fuel. Those vessels again, um, apart from the fact that they had this disadvantage in their shape, had huge engines fitted in them and so they would rack up huge costs. They had two major problems. They couldn't carry a lot of cargo and then they had a more cost than vessels that were better designed. And then the, the issue of SASBF. Well, SASBF at the time that it was a, uh, introduced, we didn't get a lot of money. I uh, was one of those who borrowed money at that time, two and a half million dollars to buy a ship. I bought a very old um, Type SD-14 vessel at that time. But the benefit for me was that I learned how to operate ships. 
I absolutely acquired the skills of operating ships internationally. That's what I uh, gained from the seed money that I got from the uh, National Maritime Authority in those days. It was two and a half million dollars. And I bought that type, type SD-40 ship. I never forget it. It was very old. And it really tasked me, you know. At that time, I was very young and really uh, fit. The Nigerian government had to pull the plug on all the projects for alleged abuse and some other irregularities. Stakeholders also criticized the projects for the absence of finance experts who had the expertise to manage and supervise the disbursement of the funds. The real challenge is the abuse that the shipping fund, you know, it's had several names. So whatever you call it has been put to. Up until now, unless the current minister is going to do it different, all sums of monies that accrue to the shipping fund are stolen or embezzled or diverted. With no handouts from government anymore and loans from financial institutions running predictably on double digits, the terrain became tougher for the indigenous ship owner. In practice, the investor has to provide local banks with contract award certificates in order to access the necessary funds, which in turn must be amortized within five years. The bank wants the customer to have um, contracts that will cover the number of years he's looking for. The oil companies that are going to hire the vessels they cannot give a long contract, number one. Number two, they don't want to give you any contract until when you have secured the vessel. And uh, it now comes that which one comes first. I can conveniently say that ship ownership and management in Nigeria is not a profitable venture because of so many factors. We have put in the horse before the cat. On a personal note, I will tell you that most of the ship owners are perpetually in debt. If I take $20 million to build a ship and I'm going to take eight years to pay back, believing that there's a job for eight years, but after the first five years you have no guarantees, then before you pay back, you probably have another contract opportunity where you have to build another ship, you take another money. So you are perpetually in debt. We do not have a financial support or system or structure that supports the industry compared to international ship owners or what is obtainable elsewhere. Though the government through some laws also have put in some what is called intervention funds like the CVFF of cabotage, which unfortunately up till this moment, it has never been disposed. Nigerians have been having problems securing funds from banks to acquire ships, especially because of either the, the loans are short term, instead of long term, or the interest rate so high that they could not actually you know, be encouraged to get these. Their foreign counterparts, on the other hand, are guaranteed by their governments and have access to loans with interest rates lower than 5%, which are payable within a period of 15 to 20 years. Prior knowledge of logistics requirements will allow indigenous ship owners to service the needs of the demanding sectors. But in spite of these challenges, a few indigenous ship owners have literally taken the bull by the horn and are thriving in the sector. Stars Investments Company Limited, renowned for operating its first vessel, MV Osayeme, with zero downtime and zero loss time injury for five years, is one of such firms that have proven to be a competent indigenous setup. There's a lot of behind the scenes work going on by all departments to ensure that that ship that's out there, is the, the crew are well taken care of, their welfare is uh, taken seriously. What they need to do their job out there is provided them. Preventative plan maintenance is put in place and vigorously followed. 
um, interface with the clients and constantly getting feedback from our clients as to safety issues, operational issues, we constantly are in touch with the client getting feedbacks and then we interpret, analyze the feedbacks we get and take necessary actions to make sure we are doing it right. And it's a continuous thing and it's a teamwork and that's how we are able to achieve it. Unique about STARS, I would say our service delivery, um, we're very particular, Scotty of our chairman, who's a perfectionist, um, we're very particular about what we do out in the field, how we present ourselves, you know, and how the image that we give to our customers. So we are one of the very few, if not only, indigenous company that has successfully managed and run, operated the vessel for five years running without any zero downtime and any lost time injury, which is a, a real serious feat in the maritime industry. Run by Mr. Greg Ogbefun, a marine engineer and ship surveyor by training, the Marine Logistics Company was established in 1986. After I left higher school at Doe College, Benin City in 1971, I had the privilege of a Shell BP scholarship to be trained as a marine engineer in the UK in 1972. And uh, in the UK, uh, Shell Tankers uh, was a company that uh, midwifed my training through college, through their ships, until I qualified uh, as a chief engineer, with first class combined of uh, steam and motor in 1980. Star's Investments is currently valued at 10 billion naira, with an annual turnover of 5 billion naira. Agbaifun attributes the organization's success to a deliberate collective effort at maintaining prescribed standards for ship operations. This is our training and our induction room, um, a very important uh, uh, facility in our organization. This is where we induct all our new crew and staff then after that, every day we have the operations meeting. Now, that meeting is extremely important. All departments, all departmental heads uh, attend this meeting. And the audiovisual unit you see at the back there is used to beam uh, on, the, on our ships, wherever they are. Every single one of our ships, we're able to see them on the, on the screen there, we discuss issues that have to do with the vessels, operations, the challenges. We, we discuss departmental involvement on each vessel's operations. At STARS, Safety, the commitment to excellent service delivery and a knowledgeable team are considered the fundamentals of success in ship operations. I would like to say that one of the reasons I have found it, I've been able to survive in, the, in this business in this country is because of the fact that I'm a marine professional. I've gone through the, the, the process of the training that's qualified and equipped me for what I'm doing. Uh, with that in mind, when I recruit people, I know who I'm looking for, I know how to read them, and I know what input to make in them to bring them to the standard I need to be able to do my job. In STARS, we do have an established structure. Our organogram is quite vast, with clear, mapped out responsibilities for our officers and executives alike. And so at the top, we have a board of directors, and then we have an assigned chairman, CEO, in the person of Mr. Greg away from. Hi, right, so everything. Everything's okay, sir. Okay. Uh -huh. Speaking on his sojourn in the sector, Ogbeifun recalls that he set sail as an entrepreneur in the shipping business in Nigeria with just 100 naira. Stars Investments uh, Company Limited in 1986, when I started, was a one-man company. I was the only staff. Um, incidentally, 
I found myself going into business. I didn't plan to. My company, OIL, had actually uh, transferred me to London on cross-posting. And before I left, uh, I decided to help my parents put up a home. So I sold everything I had to build a house. And I was just finishing that for them in Benin. It was in 1986 when I was asked to resign my appointment. For circumstances that were more personal than official. So at that time I only had a hundred naira left. I felt maybe um, I should look at working for myself. So what I did was to begin to do more of consultancy jobs which were not capital intensive, like service and inspections and all of that, and gradually built up capital. I'd like to mention an interesting opportunity that came. The Nigerian government bought a ship, a ship called the MT Tuma. That vessel was bought primarily for the purpose of using her as a storage tanker for petroleum products for where it would be distributed. So that ship was anchored off Bonny, but before they could put the ship to work, there was need to tank clean that vessel. So NMPC put out an advertisement for companies who had the competence and the knowledge to apply for tank cleaning the empty tumor. I was trained by Shell Tankers UK, so I spent all my sea time on tankers, even when I was in Kuwait. So issues about tank cleaning uh, is something that I was quite familiar with. So I applied for that job. I remember I bid something like 987,000 Naira, which at that time in 1987 was quite a for many. But I also found out that only foreign companies were the only people that bid for that job. And these foreign companies were bidding amounts in millions of Naira. So when all the bids went in, a meeting was called of all the companies and they were all came. I was the only black man, or rather the company represent was an expatriate. And the management of NMPC was asking us how we were going to do the job to defend that technical proposal. Um, some of the questions that were asked the other bidders, they said, oh, we'll have to go back to our head office, I will come back to you, and that kind of thing. But I began to copy the questions they couldn't answer. So when it got to my turn, I took permission of the panel to say, listen, I would like to comment on some of the questions that my colleagues here couldn't answer. So I ended up giving a lecture on the process of doing tank cleaning on such a vessel. And everybody said that was, that, that was nice. And of course, uh, I got this job of $987,000 in 1987. When I finished the tank cleaning contract, I made a profit of about 250000 Naira. I now found myself starts owning one ton and three badges. And that's the origin of my finding myself in this business. A few years later, he had a setback, which resulted in a loss of his investments after a local bank failed to keep its own part of a business deal. See this man, Samuel. Very good. Today, the Stars Group owns three companies, Stars Investments Company Limited, Stars Shipyard, and Eagle Watch Security Company. Agwayfung also serves as the President Shipowners Association of Nigeria and is a member of the Commonwealth Enterprise Advisory Board. I call him Oga Greg Obaifun, you know, and um, his passion cannot be, cannot be questioned. He has stayed on his course. He's done it so very well that the most difficult part of the upstream market is industry acceptance for the IOCs to trust you because they're trusting you with very, very expensive assets, very, very unsafe environment. Safety issue is a key thing. Any little compromise on safety or quality 
could damage everything. He's been able to, to earn the trust of Total. That's a great fit, and that speaks for itself. I, I wouldn't say that he lives by his dreams. He's very realistic and a very uh, die-hard business person. But he's one of the few I mentioned who can also not only be a, have a vision, what direction you have to go, but also put uh, yeah, the capital into it to realize it. I would say his leadership style is very unique. It's unconventional, not always popular, but it always gets results. So that's why the rest of us, we tend to follow him. Even if we might not agree at the onset with what he's saying, but then we know that at the end of the day, we're going to achieve what he's setting us out to achieve. But we love him anyways, because we learn that. In fact, at times I sit in meetings with him and I'm observing and I'm watching him interact with the other party and I'm just blown away with his depth of knowledge, with the way he, his perspective on issues. In the business has left his uh, mark and uh, this, uh, Look, working with him uh, entails a lot because you will see his vision and uh, his drive, where he's going, and that's the build of the company. Uh, he has that leadership quality and that keeps the company as uh, a team. Stars Investments Company Limited, endorsed by Pricewaterhouse UK, now partners with Helios Investment, an Africa-focused private investment firm for the funding of their contracts. Cabotage, which is a clone of America's Jones Act, stands on four pillars. Vessels operating within the nation's coastal and inland waters must be built in Nigeria, owned by Nigerians, manned by Nigerians, and registered in Nigeria. Through a waiver system approved by the Minister of Transport, foreigners are allowed to take on projects where there's a lack in local capacity. In order to further facilitate the acquisition and ownership of vessels to be employed in the domestic coastal trade by indigenous companies and Nigerian citizens, the Cabotage Vessel Finance Fund, CVFF, was established. The CVFF is made up of a 2% mandatory surcharge of contracts performed by all cabotage vessels, tariffs, fines and fees for licensing and waivers, interest paid on and repayment of principal sum of loans granted from the fund, and any other sum approved by the National Assembly. 2% of the sum realized from any contract performed by any ship engaged in cabotage trade must be paid to that fund, which is Capital Vessel Financing Fund. That's what the Capital Act is. Within the last 10 years, four banks were appointed primary lending institutions responsible for managing the disbursements of the Cabotage Vessel Finance Fund to indigenous companies. Indigenous companies were also scrutinized, out of which six were certified to receive a maximum of 25 million US dollars each from the CVFF. But still, it is yet to be implemented. Critics of the CVFF fault the management of the funds by public servants and have requested the government to engage the services of financial institutions instead. I think the best way is for government to announce an enabling policy and bring in the private sector whole into the process. In order to bring in the banks, banks have a way of knowing who are the best customers who have good business plans to support. They need consultants that are good in banking and in ship finance. On the way they're able to get these consultants to come in and assist them. But there must be an institution that will protect the Nemasa, protect the ship owners, and protect the bank. And those are the consultants. Ironically, as the wait continues, MV Horton, a renowned training vessel, sits abandoned on marina waters in Lagos, even as very few Nigerian seafarers get to go on sea time, a compulsory practical component of their training, without which they remain unfit for employment. The Ship Owners Association of Nigeria, SOAN, magnanimously donated a hundred training berths to alleviate the situation. There still leaves more to be done. 
A conscious review of policies to ensure that cargo is exported on a cost, insurance and freight CIF basis and all imports brought in on a free onboard FOB basis is also inevitable if Nigeria is to take charge of its shipping industry. Without a national fleet, Nigeria may never be able to regulate freight charges. Vessels plying its routes would impose their rates and the ultimate consumer bears the brunt. Under the FOB scheme, we don't control the, what vessels uh, can take Nigerian cargo. So I want to see FOB abolished and CIF introduced. That, that would be a very strong incentive to ship owners to get into the business. An enabling environment would be one in which indigenous ship owners actively participate in sea trade and are given a right of first refusal on contracts. It is fundamental for government to streamline the functions of agencies such that they do not conflict and also to jettison complicated procedures for a simplified one-stop shop. Nigeria's Apex Bank, the Central Bank of Nigeria, CBN, also needs to come up with fiscal policies that would facilitate shipping. Stakeholders are optimistic that in spite of the storm, Nigeria will someday soon sail her ships as the world watches on. <laughs>